Uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun up here just in the last 10 minutes trying to see if any of us have a memory left. And uh, it's, some of it is, a lot of it is fading with time, but uh, you'll have to bear with us. Uh, probably as, as certain things are said, maybe it'll jog our, our memories a little bit more. I think probably all of us spent either last night or early this morning uh, reading back through some of the materials from from uh, this event to uh, from the Reagan uh, visit to to uh, 20 years ago today, and so uh, th hopefully we have a little bit more uh, recollection than we did uh, 24 hours ago. But I think to kind of lay to kind of start things out today, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually kind of flip back and uh, set the table to maybe 21 years ago today, and that really was what set the stage for the. Uh, uh, for the breakthrough uh, sculpture uh, coming to Westminster College and uh, and of course the Reagan visit uh, to, to dedicate that and uh, of course 21 years ago today was the fall of the Berlin Wall and I think maybe that's a, the best way to start our discussion today and and kind of I know many of you probably have some different um, uh, recollections about that but uh, we'll start with our panel up here today and and see what what they remember and, and what they remember. I know I remember the night when we watched it on television and uh, with the people climbing on the wall in uh, between East and West Berlin and uh, with sledgehammers and everything else. And I think it was just such a surreal type uh, event that uh, I don't know if we even really truly knew exactly what was happening. But Kermit, I don't know, I can start with you. Do you have some memories from that, from that evening? Well, that was an event, I mean, uh, of a of a kind that you don't see very often in life. Uh, clearly a television event, a transitional event in uh, both political history and in, in media history, I think. Um, anybody in the room under the age of 20? Okay, so this is a history lesson for you guys and you really, other than what you've been told in a class or read in a book, don't know what the Cold War was, don't know what life within the Cold War was. Um, but those of us who were born in the middle of it somewhere, uh, that was the only image, the only things we knew about, about that part of the world was that there was this organization called the Soviet Union, which after World War II had basically clamped down on all of Eastern Europe and uh, ruled it with as repressive uh, a hand as, as there has been, I suppose, in, in political history. And we grew up that way. I mean, that's, that's what the world was. Uh, there was the West and there was freedom and there was this thing called the Soviet Union. Uh, you're all familiar, of course, with the speech that Winston Churchill gave here in 1946 in which he coined the phrase Iron Curtain and uh, first talked about something's coming, we don't know what it is, but it's, it's not going to be good. And then of course the wall goes up in 61 and uh, we begin to see what, what that really is. So those of us who came along born in the 50s and the 60s, that, that, was, that was life. I mean, you didn't know anything else. So to see this come apart at the seams, not fully understanding why at the time. I mean, we can look back and, and talk about, you know, pressure from the West and Ronald Reagan, and we can talk about internal economics within the Soviet structure, and it was unsustainable, and it was gonna happen eventually. But you didn't really understand all that at the time. You just saw this fall apart all at once, and people standing up on that concrete wall with sledgehammers banging on that wall. Uh, on the one hand, it just looked like a bunch of college kids at a party having a good time, you know, a weekend thing. On the other hand, this was stunning. This was, this was a century, you know, and, and as we had been born into that world, those people had been born into that world. They didn't know any other life than Soviet repression. This was, you know, they'd not been around prior to World War II, most of them. Most of them were your age. Um, so to, to see this transition uh, happen in front of you, was was stunning. I just thought it was it was remarkable, and it was hypnotic. Uh, more of you are probably familiar with with uh, the breakout of the war in the Middle East in 1991, and seeing the bombs go off on television, and and the uh, the nighttime cameras and the green against the dark. 
another hypnotic event with which you may be more familiar, but that was, that was hypnotic. I mean, to stand there and watch those people beat that wall down basically with their bare hands was stunning. Lauren, can you, do you remember much? That event was, as uh, Kermit said, was uh, hypnotic. Um, it also, the events leading up to it, to hear it was very symbolic that Ronald Reagan spoke at the dedication of Breakthrough because in, before he left office in uh, 1988, and I don't know what month, he stood before the Brandenburg Gate with East German guards looking with their binoculars behind the president and West Germans and other Westerners listening to the president speak, and he said, uh, and I'll probably get it wrong, but paraphrasing the president, he said, Mr. Gorbachev, if you believe in freedom, if you believe in democracy, tear down this wall. And this was just two short years before the actual collapse. But again, as, as Kermit said, even though we had these inklings and warnings ahead of time, it still was shocking when it happened. And then not only uh, did the president uh, Reagan speak in front of Breakthrough in 1988. I think it was either during the campaign in 88 or after he took office, President George Herbert Walker Bush said that there are pinpoints of light piercing the Iron Curtain or piercing the Berlin Wall, and pinpoints of light from the West are entering into the Eastern Bloc. So they both kind of talked about that, but again, it was still a shock. And then even though I left the college and, and the Churchill Museum in 2000, I still give tours to groups. And I always like to take a group and stand at Breakthrough and talk about that and say, little did we know, because most of them are, are senior citizens or older citizens who, like Kermit said, grew up during the Cold War. And we, that was the only reality we knew was the divide between the East and the West. And I say, little did we know, we could not imagine that during our lifetime that Berlin Wall would collapse, the Iron Curtain would melt before our eyes, and that's what it did. And now it's in the past, it's history, as Kermit said. Yeah. So, uh, Robert, do you think maybe the, um, the fact that, you know, we like to talk about, of course, Westminster College and Fulton being the somewhat the uh, symbolic birthplace of the Cold War, do you think that has more of a, have more of a meaning in watching the Berlin Wall coming down for people here? I think, um, I think it did. I, we had a colleague at the time, uh, Linda Pickle, who was in German studies, and um, uh, among other things, was carpool uh, for a number of years. But, but Linda had sort of developed uh, a, a number of courses on German history and, uh, and the dynamics. Uh, and um, she was, I think, uh, I think helped all, a lot of us kind of uh, feel the, the, the larger context uh, of it, both as kind of an academic perspective uh, and as an event. Again, as we, it, I think as, as Kermit and, uh, and Warren have, have uh, described really well, this, is, this was such a, a, a media event, uh, which was explosive in and of itself, um, but also in retrospect now turns out to be kind of one of several points with, uh, with Reagan's speech the next year, the, the, the sculpture uh, with Gorbachev's speech uh, a couple years later, I think the, the event as it unfolded was uh, in some ways exhilarating and bewildering. Um, but, as, but looking back, it's kind of a, a, of a dot that had uh, other dots that, uh, that were able to be connected. In the case of, of Linda, I remember talking to her about um, from an academic perspective, uh, she's, she spent decades working out uh, lines of inquiry uh, for a world that all of, all of a sudden changed dramatically. There are no longer two different Germans, two different uh, uh, threads uh, to, 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 cry, to try to discuss at the same time. So again, it seemed like uh, that one event, both emotionally and intellectually, uh, we as an academic community, I think reflected the world at large. We were, we were mesmerized by what we were seeing uh, and not quite sure uh, what it all meant. I think that's what, uh, in retrospect, uh, when, when Reagan spoke and when we, we have the, the sculpture to look at, uh, we have reminders to go back and, and, and make a fuller sense uh, uh, of the picture. And Jack, I know you, with the long history you have at Westminster and everything, I know that had to have special meaning to you in seeing the wall come down. Oh, it certainly did. I don't 
not have been moved by that experience. I, in uh, my own life, had been in Germany and Berlin in the 1950s prior to the erection of the wall, but at the time when it was a divided city and you had to go through a checkpoint to get to East Germany, they wouldn't mm -hmm. allow you to come over and take some tours. But the contrast between the two sections of the city was absolutely unbelievable. People in West Germany, that area was thriving, and the, the East German area of Berlin was uh, a very depressed and depressing area to visit. One interesting aspect of the, the occasion uh, was that we had a, an East German couple here for the dedication. When Edwina Sands went to East Germany to try to secure, at that time, one section of the wall, she uh, was directed by the East German government who said they would give her some sections of the wall, but they sent her to an area where there was a large collection of these on display. And at that time, capitalism had reared its head in East Germany, and they were selling these sections for whatever they could get for them. So Edwina went to where she had been directed to go and met this fella who was in charge of this large sort of uh, wall section area. And uh, she went out and made her selections and came back to him and said, well, I have selected eight sections of the wall. And he didn't realize at that time that the East Germans had given her permission to have these free and his eyes lit up and he thought he had made a pretty big deal here. But it, it, when it turned out that they were being given to her, she told him that, she said, if I get these sections and put up this sculpture in Fulton, Missouri, I will invite you and your wife as my guests to come to the dedication. So this couple came over and spent two or three days in New York with Edwina and her husband and then came on out here to Fulton and they were here for about three days and had all sorts of opportunities. One evening they went to a party in a fraternity house and they, they really got a taste of what American college life was like. And of course, on this occasion, they were able to meet President Reagan. And when they went back, the wife wrote me a letter and said, it's a good thing I had my camera with me because she said, our friends over here will not believe what happened to us. They have no idea that we would be invited to the United States. These, this couple had never been outside East, East Germany in their lives. And all of a sudden, they were over here almost as distinguished guests and uh, really had the experience of a lifetime. But I might also say that when Edwina went over there, her intent was to get one section of the wall. And Prior to her going, we had met with her out here and had determined that this section would be placed on the campus down here between Reeves Library and the Delta Tau Delta Fraternity House. And after she got to East Germany and found that she was able to do a whole lot better, she called me and said, I have now secured eight sections of the wall, which will stretch 32 feet. And I don't think we can put it in the location <laughs> where we had intended to set it. So she then made another trip out here after she got back and we finally decided that the appropriate location was the area between the Champ Auditorium and the Churchill Memorial. Bruce, you. Jack, tell me if this is true. I had heard a story that Edwina talked to the, uh, minister, uh, the uh, minister of Couture of the German Democratic Republic of the East German government and and they said, we'll be glad to sell you sections of the Berlin Wall. And supposedly, and I don't know if this is true or not, Edwina said, well, the French gave the United States the Statue of Liberty. You can give a few pieces of concrete or something. Is, was there, did you ever hear that story? I, I never had heard that, that story. story. But well. I know that uh, when she did talk to these people, she was trying to explain what she was going to do with them. And she said, uh, I'm going to uh, take them to a town in the middle of the country, Fulton, Missouri where my grandfather gave a speech in 1946 called the Iron Curtain speech. And these German government officials said, oh, we're quite familiar with that speech. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, one, I, other, one other thing, just I'm thinking about, the, you're talking about the contrast between East and West uh, as related to you by these folks that came over. The contrast is right out there on that monument because one side of that monument is covered in graffiti and some of it is very artistic and very expressive. I, I don't know if you young people know the word umvar, lies, untruths, that was the graffiti that was spread. That's only on the western side of the wall. There's no graffiti on the eastern side of the wall. You didn't get close to the wall on the eastern side. So the contrast between the two lifestyles, the, the progressive, the energetic, uh, the economically forward versus the repressive, the gray, the dull, the hopeless is right out there on that monument and you can see it. No doubt about it. And uh, the, uh, the sculpture, uh, the Unvar, for the young people especially, uh, I would tell the visitors that uh, it was a big lie because the East German communist government for their propaganda purposes said when they closed the border on that Sunday morning in August of 1961, and up until that time, I understood the East Germans would go over to West Berlin on Saturday night because that's where the parties were and would celebrate and stuff. And then all of a sudden at 2 a.m. on that Sunday morning, they just closed the border. And uh, they said, you can come back in, you can come back in, but no one could go out the other way. But they said, uh, we're building this wall to protect you from the evil, militaristic, imperialistic West, the capitalist West, because they are jealous of our workers' paradise on Earth and we're closing this border to protect you from the evil militaristic West. But everyone in East Germany knew it was a lie because they were closing uh, the people from East Germany to flee to the evil militaristic West. And I know Jack mentioned that uh, the sections, they were selling those sections of the wall and what I read, I think they were selling anywhere from 60,000 to $200,000 per section. Whatever they could get for. And, uh, and the section, and Edwina actually went and picked out the part she liked because of the graffiti as right. much as anything, and it was supposedly near the Brandenburg Gate, correct? They don't know exactly where right. the sections were. It was probably in that general area, but they, they can't specify that they were, they haven't seen Well, I understood there. they even had a, uh, an auction at, in Monaco, you know, the seat of communism. No, I'm kidding. Uh, in Monaco, they had supposedly an auction to raise money for health care in East Germany. They had several sections they were auctioning. I, I think I saw, actually saw a catalog of this auction. But this is the largest contiguous section in the United States today, yeah, there, correct? Yeah, there are no other uh, sections anywhere near this size. I think most of the ones that are here are actually one panel. If you go to the Reagan Library in California, they have one panel, and I think Gerald Ford had one down in Atlanta, as I recall, and a few others scattered around the country, but in each case, I think there was only one single panel. Now, when, go ahead, Bob. Um, the, uh, you were talking about where the panels were going to be placed, and I think where they ended up has been fantastic. I mean, aesthetically, it, it really works. I mean, you, uh, it's on a small uh, platform, and you can view it in a number of different ways in addition to be able to walk through it and experience that, 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 that breakthrough that Edwina was, was so eager to have people feel emotionally and intellectually. But when you're on the podium right in front of it, you know, it's too, you're too close. You're for, you, know, you can't make sense out of it. Um, and so it, it's great to be able to go across the street and look at it from, uh, from the, the, the side of the library. And so again, it's one of those sculptures that invites you to look at it from a number of different uh, perspectives, the different, the colored side of, uh, with the graffiti, the bleak side on the, uh, 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 the, that represented the East uh, uh, Berlin side, East German side, um, to be so close to it and not to be able to sort of see what, what the whole significance of it is, to stand back and to see that juxtaposed to the, uh, the, uh, the church and, and camp um, uh, auditorium. I mean, it's just, uh, conceptually, it may not have been the original plan, but once uh, Adwina uh, and others uh, lighted upon it, I mean, it really, it's worked out uh, tremendously. Jack probably knows too, there was a controversy with its present location, and, and I, I sympathize with a few people, 
but I, I, I agree Bob, with Bob completely. It's very appropriate where it was, but uh, someone who was very close to the Church of St. Mary Alderman Mary in the Church Memorial says, that's horrible that we defaced the beautiful Christopher Wren Church with this ugly piece of sculpture. But it shows the contrast, <coughs> and the whole reason of, of the church being there in the Churchill Museum is because of Churchill's Iron Curtain speech and breakthrough. And it, the contrast of, of the place of worship, God, the church there, and, and the symbolism of Churchill and the museum there, right next to the evil of the division of the world with the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, it, it, it just it, it fits together perfectly. Jack, and in this part I know more than anyone you can talk about, but let's kind of go back to, okay, the wall then was transported here. If you can talk about the logistics of, of how the 32-foot the long section was transported to the United States, the, the cutouts were uh, performed, I know, was it in New York, I think, and then bringing it here. I know you know most about that. Well, getting that over here, problem and uh, one that we weren't sure we were going to be able to solve very easily but uh, the Monsanto Corporation in St. Louis provided the funding to ship the sections over they were shipped by uh, boat arrived in New York and uh, were unloaded there at a concrete company warehouse in Queens that was in I guess April she determined what she was going to do to cut out these two figures, had to figure out how to get them cut. And if you've looked at those panels, you realize they are about six or eight inches thick and they have reinforcement running all through them. There's rebars in that concrete. And they finally ended up that they laid them flat and used a water jet with uh, pieces of garnet, I think it was, in the water. It came out with extreme force with a uh, about a, the same uh, size as a ballpoint pen might be and they were able to slice through that concrete with this water jet. They had one problem in that as they were doing it they realized that they were also cutting through the floor of the building in <laughs> which they were in. But uh, they finally got them cut out and uh, the panels then were moved from that place in Queens to the IBM headquarters building in New York City on Madison Avenue and were set up in inside that building in a large atrium where they were on display for about two weeks before they were then put on trucks and shipped out here to be, to be unloaded. And I know we were small aside, the water jet technology was developed at the University of Missouri Rolla. If you've ever been to the campus in Rolla, they have a small recreation of Stonehenge, which they put up, and it's all cut out of stone using the same water jet technology. And what? the third sculpture by Edwina Sands is on the Rolla campus because she was commissioned by a Rolla alum who happened to be here on March 5th, 1946, and witnessed the Iron Curtain speech, and he... Uh, hired Edwina. He met her here uh, for the 50th anniversary, rode out the, the train with Edwina and her sister Celia and her brother Julian for our 50th anniversary celebration. And uh, so he went to visit Edwina and he, he commissioned her to do a sculpture on the Rolla campus using that technique and they took a huge piece of Missouri granite and cut out. She likes positive negative spaces like Matisse a man and a woman figure breaking through this piece of Missouri granite, and it's on the grounds of Missouri science and technology. And that's her third sculpture in Missouri. Uh, the second one is Breakthrough, and the first one is the Branches of Promise on the campus of Monsanto Corporation. So. And where are the cutouts, Jack? Where were you telling me? That? The cutouts are actually now at the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Museum in Hyde Park, New York, oh. and have become an, the center point of another sculpture called Break Free. That's interesting in that we, we had quite a to do uh, with the man who gave the money for the plaza, Mr. Latshaw, and uh, he somehow got it into his head that he had also bought these Berlin Wall panels. How he ever got 
this idea, I don't know. But uh, at one point, he wanted to use this as a memorial to his son who had been killed in an accident. And as you'll notice over there now, there are two panels, one on either side of the sculpture that uh, indicate that that is the Lightshaw Plaza in memory of his son. But initially, he wanted to put bronze letters on the wall indicating that that was the memorial to his son. And we had a long hassle about this. And finally, I said, John, if you gave a painting to the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, would you want to put on the canvas that that, that was a, a gift from you in memory of your son? I said, this is the same kind of thing. This is a piece of art, and we cannot put the, the letters on the, the wall. So we finally settled with the two plaques that uh, commemorate his, his son. Okay, and what, what does everyone remember about the day? I mean, I can remember the huge cranes and everything lowering the sections of the wall into place up there. What does anyone else remember about that? Kermit? Yeah, I came over and took pictures and put a news story together, some of which you'll see again tonight if you tune us in at 6 o'clock. I managed to scrape all the video together, and we have one machine in the building that still plays three-quarter inch videotape cassettes, <laughs> which are about this big, and I've managed to dub it into, uh, I mean, capture it into the computer so that I can re-edit it digitally. Um, but yeah, I came over, that was the first time I'd met Edwina Sands, and uh, it was a construction project. It was, I mean, there were cranes, and there were guys in hard hats with tool belts, and uh, lifting things up and moving them around, and there was this little tiny diminutive British accented woman uh, that seemed to be in charge of everything. Show. That's right. And uh, I spoke with her, and she was very concerned that, that things were going to go back together appropriately. I mean, she had done this in New York, and it had been assembled at IBM corporate headquarters in New York, where it had spent a couple of weeks, I guess. Um, and then it all had to be taken apart and, and put on trucks and rolled out to uh, central Missouri and then all put back together and it was supposed to fit. It was supposed to look the same way that it did when it was put together the first time in New York. And she was very concerned about that, I recall that. But uh, they took their time. Uh, in fact, it may have taken a couple of days to get it really all in place. Um, and, and big cranes, uh, I, I have video of the standing back, big cranes, big blocks of concrete, church in the background, blue sky. Uh, very good looking stuff, I might admit. Um, and, and we watched this thing go up, and I, I wasn't quite sure what it was supposed to look like or was supposed to be uh, until I saw the final product, but uh, everybody seemed to know what they were doing, I recall that, and she seemed to be fully in charge. Who, who, who did, who was in charge, and who, who were the contractors? Deerhoff Construction. Okay. Local group. The uh, truck drivers who brought it out realized the significance of what they had hauled from New York City to Fulton, Missouri. It was really neat to visit with them. And we had, of course, Westminster students and faculty and staff and townspeople were gathered around watching this. And we had some high school students that were visiting campus that came. And they were so excited. And if you look at the wall, the, the sections, when we fit together, there's a section where they had put, they must have, they had put poured concrete to hold the sections together. Mm -hmm. So there was these uh, hollow sections between, if you look at each section, it was hollow, but it had these pieces of concrete that had been poured in there or masonry or something. And uh, Edwina was having them knock all this out, this uh, poured stuff through the center there. And so everybody was up chipping their little piece of concrete from, do you remember that, Jack? Yeah. I always loved the story, and I know Jack can tell this, but uh, tourists started coming to, to uh, look at the, uh, the breakthrough uh, sculpture and everything, and I think Jack was standing there in the Latchaw Plaza, and uh, was it two little ladies or a couple or something that uh, asked you a question? Do you remember yeah, that? I'm trying to remember what they... But they, uh, they asked him when they were going to fill in those two holes in the wall. <laughs> we always thought that was, was yeah, pretty good, so... Happen? And while you're, thinking, while you're thinking of that, Jack, uh, you're talking about visitors coming to see it. Because of the events of the fall of the wall of the year before, the arrival of Breakthrough, the publicity inherent with that, Reagan and Edwina Sands' visit and Governor Ashcroft's visit, and then a year and a half later when Gorbachev visited, 
the tourism at the Churchill Memorial, we were tracking it, spiked during those two years. It just jumped up because we had all this great publicity and, and everybody was conscious of the events of that time. So it drew people to Fulton to see that. I think that's, that's a good point. I mean, it, it, these are events that all got linked together and created a kind of uh, a synergy. I think the, the, the wall about 10 years a after uh, it was erected, uh, the, uh, a decision had to be made with uh, what to do with the graffiti because it had started to fade. Uh, and I think Edwina likewise, I mean, she had pretty strong feelings that, that she had a conceptual vision and she wanted it intact. But I think there was also a thought that, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to see it kind of fade uh, uh, from, uh, from the bright starkness, or sharpness rather, uh, that, it, that, it, that it is now and as it was when she uh, erected it. But, you know, again, uh, in some people's mind, uh, the idea of the fading uh, graffiti as, as this event fades into our, our memory. One of the problems with that was that it was not only fading, but we had made a mistake of putting a preservative over the graffiti to try to protect it. And uh, in so doing, apparently, we had created a problem with moisture working its way out of the concrete as the sun beat down on started to chip and peel. So that was one of the reasons why we decided to go ahead and do the, the restoration and try to get it back to it's the, the original twice. condition. Has it been twice I think now? twice now that it's mm -hmm. actually been. And some people <coughs> said, well, why didn't you put it under glass or inside a building, you know, to preserve the artwork? But you know, uh, people interested in museums and art know that you have to always do conservation. And I kind of said just out of the top of my head, I said, as, as Bob was saying, over time, the Iron Curtain will disintegrate, you know, before our eyes. Well, let's, let's jump forward uh, to 20 years ago today. Uh, we've talked a lot about breakthrough itself and how that Edwina's role and how all that came about to bring the, the sculpture here. Uh, but let's talk about the, the Reagan visit uh, 20 years ago today. Uh, Kermit, I know uh, KRCG carried the event live. What do you remember about that day? I remember it looked a lot like today, but it was a lot colder. <laughs> and that presented a number of challenges. Um, we did not have live remote capability very long at that point. And so every time we decided to do something live, that, that was a technical challenge for us. And then you had to add the elements into that. And, and you know, just getting it on the air was, was a big deal for us 20 years ago. Uh, but there was a platform on this side of the road see over the crowd and uh, the sun was out and it, it looked good the sound was good um, you know I have a, a photographer's memory of this uh, through the lens kind of memory I don't have a lot of side memory that day because you get very focused when you're doing an event of that kind and, and you shut out a lot of what's going on around you so I can't tell a lot of side stories I just remember that stage and the images that came forth from that stage. Um, the biggest of which is that's probably the last time in my life I remember Ronald Reagan, Reagan looking like the President of the United States. I mean, he would be diagnosed with Alzheimer's four years later, and we wouldn't see him at all after that. But we didn't see him much after he left office. Uh, you got to remember that was within, what, 10 months of him leaving office and uh, George Herbert Walker Bush taking over as President of the United States. So he was still very presidential in, in his demeanor and his appearance and, uh, and his appeal. Um, there was a lot of Secret Service presence around him, so that was something that had to be dealt with as well. Uh, whenever you have a, an event that involves the Secret Service, they have to come in and you have to, to get all your equipment in early. It has to be planted, then it has to be left alone, then they do what they call a sweep, where they go through and they look for uh, you know, problems technical problems, security problems, uh, and then you can't touch it. And then when you come back, you can't change anything. So uh, there was a lot of advanced, get it done early uh, kind of thing. Um, you know, Reagan struck me as a man at that time, and I remember saying it in my report at that time, as a man who probably didn't expect to live long enough to do what he was doing that day which was to preside over the official demolition 
of the Soviet Union. And I mentioned earlier, you know, we can, we can debate and discuss uh, the reasons uh, for that, but you can't discount the relentless pressure that uh, Reagan as president kept on that part of the world. And uh, ultimately, I'm sure it was their own economics that they just couldn't sustain what they were trying to do. But if he hadn't kept the pressure on, then the economics probably wouldn't have done the job. So, but, but that day, I mean, that, that was, you know, as much of a crowning achievement for him, it had to be, as anything that he did during his presidency or uh, when he stopped his public life shortly thereafter. Um, but he looked like Ronald Reagan that day. He sounded like Ronald Reagan that day. He had strength in his voice. And, and he was a man of emotion that day. I remember him uh, departing from his, his prepared text at the very end and uh, waxing uh, about the potential, the possibility of a world without walls. And this was a guy who, you know, Reagan is known now for his optimism. I mean, he was a you know, morning in America president. And, and you know he has that image, um, but on that day he you know he really believed that there would be a time when there weren't walls like that in the world anymore, and wouldn't that be wonderful? And he wanted people before they left Fulton, Missouri that day to walk away with that expectation and that hope. And uh, you know he, as I say, he departed. He that was not a prepared remark. He just he put down the notes at the end and he talked for some time about. I'll remember that. Robert, I know you were mentioning, you mentioned some things that you remembered about the actual speech. I, in preparation uh, for, for today, I think all of us tried to go back and, and find whatever documents <coughs> and, and dredge up <coughs> memories uh, of the event. And I think it gave us all an opportunity to go back and look at the speech, uh, which I remember hearing and remember being struck much like Kermit was saying, this, is, this was Ronald Reagan uh, sounding and appearing very presidential. Um, deep resonance in his voice, deep conviction uh, in what he said. I, again, heard orally, it's kind of hard to pick up everything other than the, the kind of the, the, the spirit of the moment uh, and uh, the, the, the tension that, uh, that Ronald Reagan uh, garnered when, whenever he spoke. Um, going back and reading it uh, last night, I, I was struck by how classic of a Ronald Reagan speech it, it was. I mean, both his own thoughts and the, the, the thoughts of speech writers who, who knew Reagan well um, and wove together just, just sort of the, the, the essence of it. It was a, a combination of, uh, of Ronald Reagan, the president, Ronald Reagan, uh, the orator. It was folksy uh, with, with a number of anecdotes about a, uh, uh, about a Russian woman who was, uh, who, who was, uh, whose father had suffered under Stalin, uh, an anecdote about somebody who, who was going to, uh, who uh, commented that you could come from anywhere and become an American, uh, whereas it's very difficult to go to other places and become an Italian or a French person or a Greek, uh, but people from all over the world could, could come here and become an American. Um, so in some ways, it was a, a sort of like personal folksy anecdotes that sort of captured you. But at the same time, um, as most of our speakers do when they come to Westminster, is they, they weave in the Churchillian uh, themes. And so Churchill ca uh, 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 Reagan captured uh, Churchill in a number of different ways. Uh, and some of it was in, in themes, persistence, conviction of, uh, of the values, um, but also in the kind of phrasing and the sort of cleverness uh, that, that, that Churchill had and, and, and Reagan also managed to do uh, in his speeches. Um, I think he also talked about uh, the college in a way that, uh, that uh, looking back, we always wanted to be. Uh, we wanted to be a community, we wanted to be a college that thought globally, that prepared our students for the diversity of the world, uh, to prepare them, you know, as our mission says, to be leaders in a global, global community, global context. Um, you know, when R Ronald Reagan spoke here, that was a vision, but it wasn't really the, our reality. Uh, we were a small school in Missouri that tried to s think big, but really weren't able to pull off a lot of it. Ronald Reagan sort of talked about how this school was, was poised to do those sorts of things. And sort of looking back, we can sort of see 
his speech, Greg Boog spoke to a Gorbachev speech and, and, and some of the other events, <coughs> all being uh, uh, part of a larger uh, puzzle, which is, I think, what the institution uh, has become. So again, I think Ronald Reagan, like the, uh, the fall of the wall uh, and the erection of, of Great Blue, uh, represents um, uh, where we've become as, as an institution. And Jack and Warren, I'll, I'll let you all maybe address that too, but I might add one thing. After they say, uh, maybe give us some reminiscing, uh, reminiscing about that. Uh, I didn't, Rob didn't say anything about taking questions, but we might just open it up, and if any of you have some questions that maybe uh, we haven't covered up here, we'll be certainly glad to entertain those. But Jack uh, and Warren, I know you remember uh, Mr. Reagan taking the tour of the Churchill Memorial, and do you remember any of his thoughts or anything he had to say about that? I didn't really take the tour with him. Uh, a student at Westminster, uh, who uh, now alumnus obviously, who worked at the memorial, was asked by the director, Judy Pugh, to give the tour. I was a little jealous, I wanted to, but <laughs> you know, that's, that's human nature. But I was very honored that Kevin Mathis gave him the tour, and he was highly honored to give the president a tour. I do recall a picture from the, the magazine booklet that Bruce put together after the event, a picture of the, of the president walking down the, uh, it's now called the Cuts Gallery, I, you might call it the hallway or the tunnel under the sidewalk between the church and Champ Auditorium, looking at some of the things on the wall with Kevin. And it looked to me now, in, in, not at the time, but looking back from history, you can almost see that the president's mind was, uh, anyway, I, I may have read way, way too much into it, but it kind of predicted that, that his sad demise with Alzheimer's, just by the look in his eye at the time. But again, it, he was very sharp that day. And an important part of the speech that he gave was he says, we have come full circle from Winston Churchill, sinews of peace, iron curtain speech, to this moment in time, the complete circle of the Cold War. And little did he know that he was predicting it a year and a half later, Gorbachev would come to actually symbolically close the Cold War, coming full circle from Churchill's iron curtain speech. And I don't know if Edwina referred to this in her speech, but I know I heard some discussion that Edwina felt that as, as we all know, art is in the eyes of the beholder and your interpretation varies individually in how it affects you personally. I think Edwina wants the breakthrough sculpture to symbolize more than her grandfather's Iron Curtain speech. And I think one of you, the other panelists, kind of alluded to this earlier. More, I think Jack mentioned it, more than just the fall, the symbolism of the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain but that walls divide mankind. They always have and they still, there's walls that divide us, that divide families, that divides communities, that divides faiths, that divides countries and states. And if we could only break all these walls down, I think Jack alluded to the breaking down the walls or that Ronald Reagan referred to breaking down the walls. I think Edwina, the symbolism of that is much more powerful than just the Iron Curtain. And, uh, uh, this is a little sidelight I talked about earlier, but uh, as many of you may know, Ronald Reagan's favorite role in the movie was King's Row, written by Fulton native Henry Bellaman. And Bob Cummings, a native of Missouri, and Ronald Reagan, a native of Illinois, were stars in this movie. And uh, the local bank, Callaway Bank and uh, Fulton Cinema, brought Bob Cummings, his fellow actor in that movie, to Fulton that day. And. Uh, Bob Cummings had lunch with Ronald Reagan in Holt, it was, uh, Hunter Activity Center. They had a luncheon for the special dignitaries. And Bob Cummings reminisced with Ronald Reagan and then he sat down in front of the sculpture when it was dedicated. And it was a frigid cold that day and a, a month later, Bob Cummings was dead. So they had a reunion right before his death. And then he was downtown and the president was supposed to stop at the Fulton Cinema with the King's Row marquee on the, on the theater. And, they ran out of time, so the Secret Service agent said, we've got to go on, and, and the president didn't get out and stop and get a picture in front of the theater. But anyway, Jack, you've got a lot of good things to say. Jack, <clears throat> I don't know, is there any more? I was gonna bring up the Cummings. Uh, Warren kind of jumped into that. What, what else do you remember about the day? Kurt was talking about what a beautiful day it was, and it was by the time the activity took, took place. But as you will recall, at about 5.30 that morning, it was very cold and damp. 
sculpture with Edwina, she was to be interviewed on Good Morning America on ABC and uh, with Joan London, and we were standing out there with her, and it was not pleasant. <laughs> we were all a little concerned about what the day would turn out to be, but it did turn out to be a beautiful day, and in fact, a little windy to the point that at one stage in the, the activities, the British Union Jack flew over ran across the, the podium and picked up the flag and then waved it and walked back to the podium and said, there'll be no flag burning here today. <laughs> <laughs> now, Edwina did, she, she managed to pull Mr. Gorbachev through the wall. Did Reagan walk through the wall? I can't remember. She had him up there, too. Okay. I couldn't remember that. Do you all have any questions or anything uh, related to that day that... Uh, we might try to try to answer any aspect. Yes, ma'am. I think the the accounts that we're seeing they estimated about seven thousand people, uh, but if you put that in the perspective, as we talked about a year and a half later, uh, the Gorbachev visit uh, it was anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand people. So uh, it the crowd wouldn't fit in the same place today. The addition to Reeves Library. Uh, was not there at that time, uh, and that's where a lot of people were on the hillside there and in the street. Uh, so it'd be a little bit hard to duplicate that, I guess, today in a way. But but 7,000 people was uh, was the count. Uh, probably, from my standpoint, uh, Kermit and the media members. Uh, there was probably two to 250 media uh, people. Contrast that to the Gorbachev visit was about 400. So uh, you can see, a lot of our re reminiscing, uh, the Gorbachev and Reagan visits just kind of seemed to pancake together. We, we have a hard time remembering between the two, but uh, they both were monumental events, not only for Westminster College, but uh, for the Fulton community too. And it really put the, uh, the community in a spotlight that uh, we've always benefited from. If you go out and anywhere in Missouri or elsewhere, and you mention Fulton, Missouri to people, more likely than not, uh, the first thing they will say to you, oh, that's where Churchill spoke, or that's where Gorbachev was uh, visited, or whatever. So uh, it's brought a lot of recognition to, uh, to this community, and we're very grateful for that. Other questions? Have we, yes, Doc? Coming through, coming through the wall. The wall. Yeah, that was the idea. That that's what she told me was that she wanted the symbol of coming through. Um, and I assume that that the cutouts are symmetrical and that they look the same going either way. But clearly, the, the idea was that they are coming from the eastern side to the western side. In fact, initially, when we were going to uh, place this down in front of the library, they it was going to be facing so that could go from east to west through the, the wall, but uh, there was no way to do that, so right. they have to go from north to south. Yeah, I have video of Gorbachev go walking through the cutouts. I, for whatever reason, don't have video of Reagan doing that. No the, recollection of the, him doing that. The academic that. processionals on both ceremonies walked from the East now, German side. Edwina went back and got Gorbachev and dragged him through? back through okay. <laughs> I th I'd like to tell groups on that too that uh, symbolically I think it's very ironic that Mikhail Gorbachev, the atheist president of the former atheist Soviet Union, the academic processional assembled in the church of St. Mary Alderman Berry and came out and they processed and split it the two lines, the skulls of seven went into two lines and part of it went through the female and part of it went through the male and I like to say they passed from the darkened shadows of the east, stark East German side out into the sunlit West Berlin sides of the wall before 20,000 cheering Americans. And I think I pictured Gorbachev visually moved. I didn't think he anticipated that kind of a welcome in Fulton, Missouri. And, uh, and it was also ironic that he rode, I'm going to the other event, but again, we say that kind of 
mixes together, but uh, it was ironic that Gorbachev was traveling on a two-week tour of the United States on the capitalist tool, the personal plane of, of the Forbes, Forbes magazine, the, For, uh, the Forbes family. And Jack, as far as an update on Edwina, she is living in New York. She lives in New York, yes. She's continuing to paint and sculpt, but I don't know what her current project is. And she was last in town recently? Was last, when was, when was the last, last time she was in town? Was she, she was here. Uh, and this was here in 2000. Was uh, she was here for Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. That was in. I think she was here when, when we did the, the, the touch up on the, the first She came out and did some uh, painting on the wall. Yeah. But I don't remember the last time she was here. She plans to be here next uh, March. Uh, another irony of, of, of Reagan's visit to Fulton, that was not his first visit to Fulton. He came here and I think it was in either 1952, I think it was more 1953. Um, he gave the commencement speech at William Woods, then college, William Woods College. And the trustee of William Woods was Raymond McAllister Sr., whose son was a longtime pastor, Raymond McAllister Jr. of the First Christian Church in town. But Raymond Sr. was pastor in Webster Groves. And uh, he attended Eureka College. I don't think he was a classmate, but he was a contemporary of Ronald Reagan at Eureka College. And so they were longtime friends. And uh, Raymond McAllister invited the president to come, or, he wasn't president, he was president of the Screen Actors Guild, probably. Uh, Democratic Ronald Reagan to come to give the commencement speech at William Woods. And uh, uh, there was a historian at Wet Grove City College, and that his name escapes me, but he wrote a book, God and Ronald Reagan. And he talked a whole lot about his William Woods speech and did not mention the Westminster breakthrough speech at all. But he talked about that in 52, Reagan with Nancy, they'd just been married, came to William Woods, and the president talked about kind of his vision of the future. Didn't talk about politics or president, but his kind of vision of the, of the U.S. and the world ahead. And so this author really talked about that and didn't even mention us. I thought that was ironic. Well, it is 12 o'clock noon, and uh, <clears throat> we hope you've uh, learned something today, maybe that you didn't know. I think most of us learned something again that uh, we've probably forgotten, so <clears throat> we do appreciate it. And Maybe in two years we'll be back up here talking about the Gorbachev uh, visit. So thank you.